Okay. Well, thanks everybody for the opportunity. And as I'm sharing, there's probably a lot of historical work that we've done in our community, in our area, and also recognizing that when we ventured into this, we were in different times. So this group has talked about how things have se seemingly feeling like they've rolled back, but we still wanted to offer hope and opportunity for people that may want to try things in their own community. But I'm acknowledging we are in different times. So one of the things that we like to get, you know, talking about is what do we really mean by individualized funding? There are different words used across the world for what we all mean is similar. And in terms of defining it, some of you may be familiar with the uh, international research that was done and published in 2019 that went back and looked at two two decades or 24 years of work around the world in with with individualized funding and that link is found on this powerpoint at the end but their definition for those who were included in the systematic review was it's an umbrella term for disability supports funded on an individual basis that facilitates self-direction empowerment independence and self-determination so it really doesn't matter if we're using personal budgets direct funding you know, self-managed care, whatever all those words are. And so interestingly enough, in Ontario, the Individualized Funding Coalition has used a similar definition over the years where we were looking at it as an overarching word. And for no matter what kind of names different programs are given, but that the common element is who has the control for the decision making, meaning if it's funds for a child, it's the family, if it's funds for an adult with a disability, it's the adult. And if in, you know, for some adults, it may mean their support networks and family helping them with their decisions. It's not an agency having control. So the values and principle really were grounded on the self-determination person as the decision maker, their vision guides things. People are, we look at individualized funding as a way of tailoring life and entering everyday spaces, being able to contribute, being included, participating, and looking at people as valued citizens versus the whole historical devaluing of people and seeing funding needing to be flexible and portable. So this is a little bit of our history and how we started to make change and people were asking for things and we thankfully had some autonomous groups outside the system and we had partners that were agencies that were very willing and we were able to make change. So I'm just going to go. One of the things that we put in place was as a result of some conversations with Tom Nurney and that was there was a fear of things becoming more managed in Ontario. There was the whole thing about people wanting to have more choice and freedom but agencies were still operating in what I call sort of a model that was taken from the old days of the institutions and then it just became something that pe happened in our communities and people were still feeling like they didn't have a lot of choice in group living, let's say. So Tom suggested you set up a position in the community that would have a broker facilitator that is separate from service delivery and separate from government that could help people with planning, envisioning and brokering their funds. And so that's what we did. It was a project in the beginning. It was evaluated with really strong feedback. And to this day, it's called Windsor Essex Brokerage for Personal Supports. And they offer the independent facilitation and planning uh, for folks who have a developmental disability. It was just developmental disability, although we know it could work for everything. Seniors, people with mental health issues, it could work. So similar positions are existing worldwide under different names again, right? Where you're working for that person and their voice. This particular diagram is important to me because my dear friend Richard Reston, who was at the time the president of People First Windsor and People First Ontario uh, and other uh, self-advocates helped pick the diagrams. Nowadays, we might use real pictures to express the role of brokers, that they are neutral and independent. And he picked different ice cream flavors for a picture, which had some of us shocked because we were trying to get away from the whole child thing that people would view people as child. And he said it was so significant because him and others who had lived in institutional type settings were only ever offered vanilla ice cream. 
sometimes. And for him, it was a metaphor of being able to pick whatever you wanted for your life. So very powerful. And then he saw the person as the director. So he wanted a director's chair and that not this chatter about the person's at the center and everybody's around them. He hated that. He wanted to be in the director's chair with the support of people, family and friends and others and directing things that brokerage provided good information, did a medi mediation and negotiation, helped write up contracts that agencies, people, families were involved in. And they listened deeply. Number one, they were to support the person's voice in the context of everything else. So to this day, this is a diagram that gets shared. And I'm going to end it here and go to the video. But at the time, we were looking at a way to have very powerful functions separate, meaning autonomous groups like our family network and people first being there to really advocate for people without strings that we have the independent and autonomous facilitate facilitation although paid for by government it was not attached to an agency that did the direct service or a government function for applying it became the independent voice of the person and then service delivery we saw a really good role for people that would want to help flow funds for people if that's what the government required but then also give them easy ways to support you know hiring their own contracted workers and tailoring their lives and then at the time allocation and access was different in every community and sorry since that time uh it is now called developmental services ontario and was set up to determine eligibility access applying and assessing for They've got it's broadened into other roles, but I won't go into that now. We believe it should be clean and keep its role as a system entry point. So anyway, I'm going to go to Tom now. And um, for those who don't know, Tommy did the work on the self determination projects in the year 2000s, and he led that work, set up a center for self determination, and then ended his career working on health quality and ethics around. You'll hear him say long term care. Long-term care for us in Ontario means nursing homes type long-term care. Long-term care in the U.S., I understand, means when you're supporting people over the long term and it doesn't necessarily mean health and nursing homes. So for people that, you know, that's important for people to know because it can throw you off. I don't think it's possible for individuals with disabilities to uh, obtain full citizenship without adopting quality standards that are based on universal human aspirations. I think we must norm quality then on those everyday freedoms that we all take for granted. Otherwise, we will revert, especially in the United States, to the industrial J.D. Powers definition of quality and success, and that is satisfaction with human services instead of pursuing a meaningful life in the community. What follows, and I will keep this short, can be found in more depth than in a book that is going to be published soon, I hope, uh, called The Threshold of Freedom. And the title is very deliberate, as you might imagine, uh, because we're not there yet. But that's where we have to go, and it's my writings and lectures uh, for the last 25 years, my journey, if you will, uh, in self-determination. I do have at least one paper in the syllabus, I think, which sums up a lot of the issues. Uh, it's called Lost Lives. Uh, and that uh, is a little more direct uh, and less polite than I intend to be here. 
The meaning of self-determination in the United States has evolved, in our view, to encompass three levels of change, the personal, the organizational, and the political. On the personal level, self-determination is meant to be transformational. On the structural or organizational level, it requires fundamental change. And I'm only going to be able to mention a few things in describing this. And then on the final level, the political level, it's going to require a concerted national and I believe international movement uh, to increase the power of individuals with disabilities and uh, the power of the self-determination movement. On the personal level, for example, the only ones who can assist in helping a person plan are those who are invited. These plans must reflect a new set of quality standards, which I'm going to go through quickly, but it's at the heart of what I want to leave you with uh, uh, today. On the personal and structural level, and this is one of the reforms, planning and budgeting are melded together into one. Uh, they're not separated. So then self-determination in the U.S. rests on these three pillars. A fundamental restructuring of the human service system, personal planning and budgeting that moves from services to supports for a meaningful life, and the political dimension then, uh, where I think we're way behind, we have so much more work to do. In terms of restructuring, some examples you're familiar with, uh, the use of fiscal intermediaries, where an individual's allocation gets deposited and they take care of paying bills and making sure taxes and other issues are taken care of. Unbiased planning assistance, uh, and I think we all know what that might mean. We would like to see uh, individual brokers who are very well trained in self-determination begin to assist individuals. But at every step of the way, the individual with a disability has the right to hire and to fire any person who provides support. The movement from congregate to individual and community integrated settings is absolutely key and fundamental to the change as it is, I believe, in all of the countries. Individual budgets based on individual allocations is important. In the United States, the, one of the key mistakes that have been made now uh, for several years is if a person has an individual allocation, people are calling that an individual budget. And in the design of the line-by-line -line budget, they lose control. So I think the distinction between the allocation and the budget is extremely important. Something very important happened in January of 2014. The federal adoption of some of the principles of self-determination that we have been advocating. 
the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the largest funding source in the U.S. for what we euphemistically call long-term care, came out with new regulations for what constitutes living in the community and new regulations for what they call person-centered planning. You'll never hear me use the word person-centered planning because everybody says they do it. And with a thousand meanings, it in fact has no meaning. Here's some examples of what they're saying has to be in place. And these are very unusual, especially for the federal government to do after pressure from uh, some of us. But a person living in the community has to have a landlord-tenant relationship. And it has to be in writing, and it has to mirror in all important ways uh, the same kind of tenant landlord relationship of anybody else. Real integration, which is a huge issue for the provider agencies. Real integration in this case uh, means that the person has to be embedded in the community and can't be living outside the community and still receive community funds. They can have visitors at any time, night or day. Some of the little things are, you know, extraordinary for an individual. Uh, they can have food and access to food any time of the day or the evening. They can have private community, the means for private communication with people outside where they live. The personal planning, and I think I mentioned this, has to be conflict of interest free. So let me go to the key to what I think has to happen. Universal human aspirations. The first one, a place to call home where the person with a disability has control over anyone who enters for any reason. Community membership, which means not passive belonging in the community, but active membership in organizations. And the pursuit of friendships and long-term committed relationships. And these latter two especially uh, are part of how we see health and safety. People who do not have long-term committed relationships are the ones who are most vulnerable. The pursuit of private income, and by the way, for working age adults, uh, we take the position uh, that there are no exceptions. And the last one, which is key to having real freedom in the community, is control over the means of transportation. We have two guidebooks we developed uh, to help people with this. The first one is real life quality standards, and the second one is creative individual budgets. The political issue I leave to discussions that we're going to have following this meeting. And hopefully, by reaching out to other countries, uh, and individuals who want to collaborate on an international level, I think we can make some headway. In the United States, we have forgotten our history. We were once a civil rights and human rights movement. 
and most people who work in human services today do not know that history. We cannot forget, and this is my last comment, our goals must be, because of all the intricate work that has to be done, we cannot forget that our goal is to be able to walk and wheel together as equals, to dine together as equals, to work together as equals, and finally, to love each other as equals. Thank you. Not see any of you. I will just quickly. Uh, I, I don't want to mess up that what people might be thinking about around what Tom has said, but I'll just do a couple of highlights for people who can go back to the PowerPoint. The partners that helped work on this particular uh, PowerPoint and presented it a couple of years ago to executive directors in Ontario was our independent facilitation and planning organization, a direct service provider, and family network and you can we all have sort of shared beliefs for people having control of their life and being included you can see all that there are a number of ways we partner and what I guess is important for people who are working in organizations or with folks that are wanting change it's to kind of look at what small thing can you do what can you look past in your community in terms of a barrier uh you know, in t and really living out the values of uh, self-determination, choice, and inclusion. Are there agencies that can invest in things and carve funds out? Um, is Can you start at putting in place somebody independent to work with people um, when something is not working? Can you, as a community a a in a geographical area, make change? I do realize the Medicaid system is a little different, but are there agencies out there that are interested in looking at just tell us, you know, instead of, oh, no, you can't do it, let's figure out how. And then uh, this is how we are currently working. And the system has changed and there hasn't been big investments to expand the independent facilitation 20 some years later. So there's demand and people waiting and not getting help. Um, but in the end, I guess to be effective, we really believe that personal planning needs to be directed by the person, separate from, as I mentioned, eligibility, service delivery, and the funding flow, and uh, that a neutral person be uh, the person that helps with the planning and be there for that person's voice. So we have tried to keep the person's voice at the forefront and make sure the control and decision making is with that wherever we can and uh, for those who would want it as an option and um, at the heart of it is hope especially in these times where we see things shrinking back across our province and across other parts of the world this picture is a lot of folks favorite because when people start thinking of a vision and they're working with a they're working with a facilitator and they start thinking of ideas, uh, you know, you might have the facilitator saying, tell us, tell me what home means to you. What's that like? Families may go off and do some homework. Usually the people are ready to move and their support network or their families are still working on things, but you try things, they don't work. You go back to the vision and you just keep, keep working on it. So these are some links that people can use at the end of the slide. And I wanted to rush past so we can have a, more of a conversation uh with um about what you heard and any at me answer any questions